Hi, this is Amaya from FinQuest Institute. In this video, we'll understand the difference between a trading book and a banking book. So let's look at the trading book first. So trading book comprises of assets and liabilities which are held mainly for trading purposes. So something which is held by the treasury teams in banks. So as we know, every bank has a very active treasury department. So these are the groups of traders who will be transacting on behalf of the bank. And whatever activities are done by the front office or the trading team gets booked as a part of the trading book. Now, whatever positions are hold, held as a part of the trading book are required to be MTM. So MTM can either be marked to market or it can be marked to model. So if it's marked to market, then that implies that a liquid market price is available for a certain asset. So imagine that we are holding a certain bond as a part of the trading position and that bond is very, very liquid and we have a current market price for that particular bond. Then this price is what will be marked on the books and this is what we call as a mark to market. The next is mark to model. So many a times we hold certain products which are customized. So talk of any OTC transaction, let's say an interstate swap which a bank has struck with another counterparty bank or with a customer. So as we know, interstate swaps are OTC transactions, something which are customized between the two parties. And for this, we may not have a very active market. So for this, we may not have a ready market price which can be procured. So at this time, banks may have to employ what we call as uh, internally developed models or customized models in order to estimate what is the fair value of that particular instrument as of a particular day. And calculating the price of the product in this way is what we call as mark to model. So be it mark to market or be, be it mark to model, this is something which has to be done on a daily basis. One of, one, one of the reasons why we have to do this on a daily basis is because uh, these are products which are very, very sensitive to market risk factors. So when we say risk factors, it could be interest rates, it could be FX rates, it could be option volatilities, etc. All of these have an impact on the price of these assets. That's why pricing of these things on a daily basis is required. So you'll observe that every bank has a certain mechanism which will calculate the MTM of their entire trading portfolio on a daily basis. Further, relating this from a capital charge framework, because as, we, as you know that every bank needs to keep aside a certain portion of their capital, which we call as a regulatory capital. So when we talk from a trading book perspective, there is a market risk capital charge which needs to be computed. So there is a standard methodology which is prescribed by regulatory guidelines, which gives us the steps which are to be followed for calculating how much is the capital charge for uh, every asset which is sitting as of, uh, as, on, as of a certain day on the trading book for the bank. So the point you have to remember is the MRCC or market risk capital charge as we call it. Next, let's look at the banking book and let's try to contrast these things. So banking book may comprise of positions which can be like loans, overdrafts, etc. Now the treatment for these products again, uh, it is going to demand certain bit of uh, capital charge calculations again. So, so whenever we talk anything from a banking book perspective, it is the credit risk capital charge which is calculated. And again, that is something which is applied for all of the products which sit as a part of the banking book. And as we know, the, the core business of the bank is borrowing money from customers and lending money to businesses and entrepreneurs. So you can imagine the size of the banking book. Uh, it's considerably large and that's why a bank is always concerned with the kind of credit risk which is embedded for this particular book. Now let's try to understand uh, a few things from an accounting perspective which are relevant from the banking book perspective. Now although we do not require to do an MTM on a daily basis, however certain accounting rules like IFRS 9 uh, and a few other accounting guidelines uh, specify a certain points which are specific to the banking book. So as we know, whenever a certain loan has been advanced to a certain borrower, then the borrower is expected to make periodic interest and principal payments at specific points in time, which we call as a loan repayment, which the borrower does. Now, if the principal and interest payments are done by the borrower at the designated points in time, 
then these are recorded on the books as principal amount owed plus the accrued interest and this is something which is considered as a part of the profit calculation especially the interest accrual which is done that is something which would factor into the profitability computations now let's imagine that a borrower does not pay for 90 days so the technical name for this scenario is what we call as a NPA or a non-performing asset. So any borrower who is unable to make payments for a period of 90 days or more is classified as a NPA for the bank. Now, uh, any kind of subsequent interest payments which are made by the borrower or interest repayments, these are not used in calculating profits. And the third scenario is imagine there is an increasing probability that the principal which is owed that is also something which the borrower is unable to repay. Then this is something which will be classified as a loan loss. And whenever a loan loss has been classified, we have to book it against what we call as the loan loss reserves, which we study next. So loan loss, so whenever we have the concept of loan loss reserves, then this implies that the actual loan losses are adjusted against these reserves. So finally, whenever we are going to show uh, the position or profitability of uh, our loan book on the income statement, they take into consideration this loan loss reserves as well. So finally, what is going to flow onto the income statements is an estimation of the loan loss which are going to be incurred. So generally higher the loan loss, higher would be the impact which will have on the income statement. A few popular measures which are adopted by banks in order to handle such loan losses. Firstly, depending on the bank's estimates, the bank may want to increase or decrease reserves over time. So one of the most popular techniques which banks apply. Next could be restructuring of debt to avoid any kind of imminent losses. So imagine there is a certain borrower to whom the uh, bank has lent money and the borrower is currently uh, facing some bit of stress and the uh, borrower is unable to make periodic repayments which are due to the bank. So what the bank can actually do in this scenario is it will go in for a process of debt restructuring or debt rescheduling as we call it. So debt rescheduling implies that more amount of debt is advanced to the borrower so that the current loans can remain up to date and the bank does not have to take on any current losses uh, because of the loan because of the potential loan loss so that gets taken care of however exercise and uh, the bank should exercise sufficient caution that they have done ample amount of checks in order to ensure that the additional lending which they are doing to the borrower is not going to be detrimental in the long run that is it should not happen that the borrower is going to default on these loans going ahead so whenever a bank has to go in for any kind of debt rescheduling or debt restructuring, uh, they always exercise a certain degree of due diligence and they are very careful in these instances because they want to avoid any kind of potential defaults which can happen uh, on behalf of the borrower going forward or in the future. However, it's a very effective technique for banks to ensure that the older loans which are sitting on the book, uh, they are not classified as loan losses but they can continue to be up to date and so that they contribute to the profitability of the bank and subsequently as the uh, as the borrower situation improves and as the borrower starts making periodic repayments which are due as per the new debt reschedule that is something which the bank will recover over a period of time also banks tend to smoothen out their income year over year so many times you uh, whenever we read anything from analysts, so analysts generally talk about uh, volatility in earnings. So when we say bank is trying to smoothen out its income, that is they are technically they are trying to reduce the volatility which is observed in the earnings. And that is something which is preferred by stakeholders as well. So analysts or investors or even potential investors. They would also prefer banks to have a consistent flow of income rather than having too much of volatility. So banks generally tend to overestimate reserves in good years and they tend to underestimate the reserves in bad years so that they don't have to have too much of volatility in the reported income as a part of their income statements. This completes a, a very basic review of the banking book versus the trading book. In our subsequent videos, we'll talk a bit more about the pricing of products which sit on these books along with the risk management techniques which are popularly applied by market participants in order to hedge their positions in both the trading book as well as the banking book. 
So do subscribe to our channel on YouTube to stay tuned with the updated videos. Thank you.